you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show. Dot com. Hey, we're coming here with a, another great podcast. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Be sure to give us a like, subscribe to us on YouTube, hit that bell notification so you can see the video version of this. Also, for your friends to the cvpn.com or the Chris Voss Show. Dot com and uh, tell them to subscribe. Say, do it. If you want to change your life, you want to make it better, or maybe you don't want to make it better, maybe you want to make it worse, subscribe to the Chris Voss Show podcast, and you can do that as well. You can see all the authors that we're having on the Chris Voss Show podcast at, uh, what is this, amazon.com forward slash shop forward slash Chris Voss. We've got all the books that of the people we interview on the Chris Voss Show featured there, so you can easily go through and pick the ones you want. Grab them all. Hell, we've only had the greatest authors on the show, so there you go. Uh, you can also go to our new book club. We're trying to get launched, patreon.com forward slash Chris Voss, and subscribe there. We're going to talk about the show, talk about the authors, talk about the books, kind of the behind the scenes of everything that we do here at the show. Uh, today, we've got a most excellent author, and uh, she's quite brilliant. She's written a multitude of books, more than I can count. I went to public school, so um, uh, there you go. Uh, but <laughs> her name is Ann Werner, and we're going to be talking about her new book called The Melt, and it's very apocalyptic, so it's kind of fitting for what we're experiencing right now. It might be a good guide maybe in the future. I don't know. Uh, according to her bio, she's always had a voracious curiosity and loved doing creative things. Uh, the combination of two has resulted in her lifetime experiences from the mundane to the ridiculous to the sublime she's pretty much run the gambit at one point in the time she even sold the cemetery plots that should be interesting and uh, didn't last long and she became a professional actor uh, her most notable role uh, was eliana on the soap opera days of our lives for nearly seven and a half years so you probably saw her on tv and uh books have been her passion she started writing in earnest in 1997 and she's been writing most of her adult life uh, she loves to entertain people, thinks it's very important to do. I think it's very important to you to entertain people. Uh, and when you're having a bad day, when your heart gets broken, when things seem bleak, you can always find a few minutes of respite in the pages of a book or watching your favorite movie, TV show, or movie, she says. Uh, she tries to provide that respite for people. And... Um, I feel that she's written something worthwhile. And she's written a lot of books, so people are definitely liking them. Welcome to the show. How are you doing, Ann? Well, thank you very much for having me, and I'm doing just great. Well, thank you for coming. Your new book, The Melt, yeah. this is uh, fitting for our times a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, can you, uh, oh, let's start out with your plugs where people can find you on the interwebs first. Okay, well, um, if you go to Amazon.com and you input my name, you can, or you input any of my books, then you can go to my author page. Um, then I also have a website, and it is annwerner.info. Um, and when people go to look for it, make sure that they spell my last name right. It's W-E-R-N-E-R. -E um, you know, and then I am on Twitter. I'm at Ms. Werner, and uh, I'm on Facebook and Instagram as well. Awesome sauce. So we had your daughter on, actually, on the show earlier. Yeah. Uh, about, about a month or two ago, and she was really wonderful. Um, so uh, the book, The Melt, why did you write it, and uh, what's it about? Well, I hadn't written anything in a while, and I was kind of looking through all my, I keep a folder with all kinds of ideas in it, and nothing really resonated with me. But I used to write for a liberal, uh, thing called Liberals Unite. I used to write for Liberals Unite. And one of the stories that I had written um, was about some French scientists who discovered an ancient virus when they were doing core samples up in the uh, Siberian, uh, whatever, you know, way up north in, in, in Siberia. So that kind of occurred to me, and that's what kind of, that, that's what actually gave me the idea for the melt. 
Um, and I just thought that would be, that would be a, a, a really cool thing to write about. Now, mind you, this was in the autumn of 2016. I had no idea we were going to go through a <laughs> pandemic. Um, and usually it takes me about a year to write a book. But this one, it took me about, well, three and a half years from the time I started until I finished. And that was because I was, at the time, uh, I was living in Northern California. My place was for sale. Um, and then I was going to take it off the market, but then somebody walked by my house and saw the sign and they called me and then it was like, okay, drop everything, stop writing. I had to get on a plane because I sold my house. I had to get on a plane. I had a, cause I was going to come back to the East coast after 40 years and, um, find a place to live. And then I had to fly back. I had to pack up and do all that kind of stuff. So it was this, <laughs> it was this protracted thing, but that's, you know, that's where I got the idea. It was from that article that I'd written, uh, for liberals unite. Awesome sauce. So this is kind of interesting. It, <laughs> members of the last tribe of reindeer herders discover a body in the melting permafrost of the northern Mongolia steep or step? Step. Oh, I went to post school. Uh, <laughs> and the virus dubbed the scourge is unleashed on the world. So uh, it's kind of like the coronavirus, only uh, it's got a better name that's kind of more, I don't know, look better. Yeah, the, red the, titles, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> the red scourge. Yeah. Um, so there you go, unleashed on the world. Uh, how similar is the Red Scourge to uh, coronavirus? I mean, if you don't mind me asking. Well, it's way, way, way different. I mean, the oh, yeah? Red Scourge kills 95% of oh, the world's wow. population. That sounds scourgy. Yeah, it's, it's pretty scourgy, and it's, it's pretty nasty. All right, so definitely, definitely 2020, don't listen into this. We don't need this to end up on the... <laughs> apocalyptic bingo for 2020 don't give it any ideas so um g give us some more details on the book where the story evolves around uh does it mainly stay in the uh in russia or does it spread all over the world well um it it spreads all over the world okay it, it starts out in mongolia and the, and the northern mongolian steppe when when these reindeer herders discover this body um so i, I wrote the book in two parts because a lot, of, a lot of the dystopian books that uh, are on the market today, they happen after the fact. Um, so whatever has happened has already happened, and then the whole world's in disarray. I thought that I would like to take the readers through what it would be like. So I have the discovery, and then I have the, what happens after it's discovered, um, and then I have a, and then I take it from Mongolia. Um, I go from Mongolia and I go to the CDC. Mm -hmm. And then from there with all of the, you know, the monkey mucks who are going to do whatever they're going to do about it. I go to this young couple in Silver Spring. And so this young couple in Silver Spring, uh, they're shopping for a house. They have no idea what's headed their way. Um, but then they buy this house. Now the house, because the guy wants a man cave. So this is their dream house because this particular house is an older house. It was a, it's a, it's a post-World War II house when everybody was afraid of the atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. So it's got a bomb shelter. And mm -hmm. this is where they escape the virus. They go in there. Um, so that's the first half of the book. And it's, it's what they go through. It's leading up to going into the shelter and then being in the shelter. And then after they've been in there, when they come out, what happens so then the the second half of the book is is talking about you know where do you go when the world that you know it has is just gone yeah so that's that's kind of what i do no more starbucks the world's over no man. more, no more <laughs> starbucks no more internet, no more nothing so how much did the coronavirus pandemic influence the story did you already have it uh, submitted well, I finished the I finished the book uh, in November of last year, mm -hmm. and then I started, you know, going through and doing all my little tweaks and everything. So when the coronavirus came up, there were a few things that it was like, oh, you know, I mean, I who had ever heard of social distancing? I mean, so that's a term that found its way into this into the story. Um, another thing that I, I had been seeing a, a news report one night. Uh, and, and I guess some of the people from the CDC were being interviewed and they were talking about small particle spread. So 
you know, making it aerosolized, all mm -hmm. right, which the coronavirus is just droplets, mm -hmm. all right, but, a, but this one here is a small particle, and, and you don't really have to cough, you don't have to breathe it on other people, you don't have to do anything, because in, in my virus, spores from it are shed off of your body. Oh, man. And you don't even know that you have the virus until you are, quite frankly, at death's door. It, it wow. feels like catching a cold. And you've already given um, it to everyone else. Yeah. And that, wow. yeah, and, and that's it. And I mean, and you're just, you're shedding these spores. You don't know that you have it. And then by the time that you, you feel like you're getting a cold and within 24 hours, you're dead. Horribly this, suffering dead. Horribly suffering dead. So it's kind of Ebola, e Ebola sort of. Sort of well, yeah, it's stuff. kind of a mixture of Ebola and the Spanish flu. Mm, that's my kind of drink on a Friday night. Little <laughs> there vodka, you go. <laughs> mix a little of that in. Here you go, man. Take a <laughs> shot of that, baby. 2020, coming at you live. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Some of the characters in the story, particularly the president, are very familiar. Uh, uh, what is it on purpose? or? Uh. Yeah, because he had just he had just been elected when I had started. You know, uh -huh. I actually started this story before he was. I don't even like to say he was elected. Okay, before he was installed <laughs> into the Oval Office, um, he, you know, he he had just and I I knew that we were in for some bad stuff. But you and me, no, I don't think anyone could possibly have envisioned. However, what really surprised me. Uh, when I was going through this, because mind you, you know, he, he had not really shown his full colors. And what surprised me was some of the ways that he acted, especially about the virus. I, there was no way I could have known how he would react. And yeah. yet, that's what I put in the book. And it's President Tower, you know, a little Trump Tower. Uh, oh, so. <laughs> President Tower. So, yeah, so, um, so uh, it, it really did kind of surprise me how accurately I predicted what he would do. That's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, you know, narcissisms are, narcissists are pretty interesting people. I, I've known a couple. That's why I kind of knew he was bad. And I, I've known, I mean, I'm not known, known, but I've known of Donald Trump studied him. I used to think he was hot when, you know, the Art of Deal came out. And then within a few years, it was like, hey, man, something's up with you. Uh, and then the more you watch him, does, uh, does president tower have small hands, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, small mind, small Maybe mind. Small hands and yeah. Um, thing. <laughs> so you split the book into two parts and then of course, uh, we'll ask you this later, uh, the pandemic and the aftermath, uh, most of the stories of this nature begin after the destruction. Um, so why'd you put it in two parts, I guess? Because I wanted to take people. I didn't want to be like so many of the other books. Mm. You know, I did some research. I mean, uh, one of my very favorite books, and I read it twice. And once I get finished with this series, I will read it again, is Stephen King's The Stand. Uh -huh. um, I also read, but, you know, that starts after the virus. Mm. Um, I also read, somebody had recommended a book to me called The Earth Abides. I cannot remember the author. But this, this book was written, I think, back in the 1940s. And that book started after the virus. Mm. Now, I think there's a, I think there's a, a book out by, uh, now by Nora Roberts, I think. Yeah, I think it's by Nora Roberts called Day One. Now, I think from just reading the description of the book, because I have not read it, but I think um, it, 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 it takes place at least for part of the actual pandemic before everything is all said and done. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong because I haven't read the book. But, you know, every, everything I've, I've always seen, it, it's always when it's all done. Yeah. You know, yeah. The and virus so I wanted is to, just so story I wanted to of people up, surviving it. Because it really is, I wanted a study of human emotions and human mm. reactions to what was happening around them. Yeah. Like I, like one of my favorite movies, not my favorite, but I, one of the movies I've always loved is the thing. And, you know, it's cool when they find the ice or like alien, you know, where they find the, you know, you see them find the thing and then, you know, 
everything goes down from there. But to me, that's better than coming in at the end where you're just like, what, what, what happened? <laughs> yeah. So that's cool. Um, you marked the book as book one yes. um, of the After the Apocalypse series. Uh, you plan to do more in the series? Yeah, I want to do, I, I, I'm aiming for at least three. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I'm always scared to death. So is it, are they going to be called the melt, more melt, and holy shit, lots of melt? No, I'm I just have no idea. You know, I came up with the name. I came up with the name, the melt, right away. Okay, yeah. but I have no idea what I'm going to call the second or the third. I just, but I never ever know what my. I just get an idea for a book and then it becomes mm-hmm. organic. I'm not one of these people that knows the whole story. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I have so many characters in the story. They just like, oh, okay, I'm going to put this in oh okay i'm gonna do that and they're just organic and yeah so i, yeah, I have no idea what my title problem. are gonna be and and i really don't even i kind of kind of kind of know what i'm gonna do with the second one only mm-hmm. because i've got a cliffhanger sort of ending mm-hmm. but you know i don't know how i'm gonna do it yet oh i have little go. i have i have i've been writing it in my head Mm-hmm. So I, I have notes everywhere. I've got these little post-it notes everywhere and I've got, you know, I have like little papers all over my house and I have little notepads here and notepads there. I've got a big folder with ideas. I have a folder on my computer. I mean, it's insane. When I actually sit down and try to compile all of this, my eyes will be rolling back in my head. Yeah. It's the editing that kills you, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> there you go. Uh, so the cover of the book has the melt on it and it shows, uh, basically the planet melting. And I, and I guess that, uh, the intention of that is to talk about, uh, uh, how this virus came from the, uh, melting, uh, global stuff. Yeah. 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 Global warming. You never know what's going to happen with global warming. And what's funny is since you started writing the book since, I don't know, it's funny, but 2016, I mean, we've had some really crazy stuff going on with the ice caps. I mean, they've been melting even further. Yeah. I believe Russian trawlers can actually go across the North Pole now from one end to the other where it used to be they couldn't. So, um, uh, you know, that maybe that's 2021, you know. I mean, right now, 2021's got a lot to live up to. I know it, 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 this is a truly, here. truly, truly scary time for so many reasons. Yeah, like the this this is an apocalyptic book, but at this pace, it might be an uplifter. <laughs> <laughs> true? You're like, well, shit, this isn't as bad as what's going on now. I feel good about this. Let's well, do this I do part. Try to, I do try to have some uplifting stuff in the second half of the book. Mm-hmm. Well, Although that's good. There's quite a bit of stuff that goes on that's like, oh. So is the story mostly uh, in the second half uh, focusing around the couple? Oh, it's, it's focusing about um, a community. Um, okay. Basically, what happens is when they, when, they, when they get out of the shelter, and then this, this, this really, I mean, some really this terrible, terrible thing happens. And so they just can't stay there anymore. And mm-hmm. uh, they wind up going to... Um, uh, Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, mm-hmm. where um, the guy in the book, his name is Ethan, his father uh, had a, a vacation cabin. And mm-hmm. so they decided to go there. So when they get there, um, it, it, there are some people there. And then I, I pick up the story after they've been there six months. So it's this small little community of, of 35 people. Mm-hmm. Everyone's trying to survive and just, yeah, just trying to survive. So it's, it's the story of, of this community. And then of course, you know, you, you have to bring in stuff that's going to be going against what they're trying to do. So mm-hmm. is that what actually would happen in real life? So I try to, you know, I, I try to, I try to keep it believable and I, and I try to keep all the people in the book believable mm-hmm. and even the, 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 the villain, the villain is, um, he's, he doesn't know that he's a villain. Ah, I think some people don't know they're evil, but or they're behaving in an evil manner. They think they're doing good. Yeah. Is that, is that usually the thing of most characters where they're, they think they're doing a good thing, but they're not. 
And well, it depends. It depends, I guess, on the character. Some of them, some of them know damn well what they're doing. Yeah. In, the, in, in the book that I wrote about this uh, satanic serial killer and crazy mm-hmm. the villain knew what that villain was doing. Yeah. <laughs> Use these. Hopefully, I don't know. Hopefully, what, where, where do you get these words? Uh, you would think that a serial killer would uh, would kind of know after a while that hey, you know, uh, murder is illegal, eh? And uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm doing it, so uh, and not only that, I'm getting this a must be bad. Out of it. <laughs> I mean, it's good for me. It's working yeah. out for me right now, but this seems kind of bad. Like I shouldn't do it. Like I probably should hide the body because this is bad. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is my day uh but no it, it's interesting how many books have you written total well let's see i've written the people next door dreams and nightmares crazy cooper's grove I've got a couple of short stories one's called uh a view from the meadow the other is the chemtrail conspiracy then i've got the milk and then um i've got two anthologies that i wrote with my daughter kimberly Johnson, who, you know, as you mentioned, you interviewed her. Uh, we did the Virgin Diaries, mm-hmm. which was a compilation of 72 stories from real people. Uh, we gathered them off of the internet. Um, they're all anonymous, so people wouldn't, you know, so they wouldn't sugarcoat. <laughs> and it was basically, it was about their first experience, the people that responded, um, their first, about their first time, I guess their ages ranged from 20 to 77. 77 the had what sex, they're telling me about the first time they had sex 77 so that, yeah that was the age of our respondents i mean we really had wow. we did half men half women we included gay people huh. we wanted a real cross-section yeah. of people it's it's really kind of a fascinating 77. study seven yeah 77 talking about the first time that it was it was a it was a gentleman uh yeah about his first sexual experience and basically it was talking about it's talking about um the emotional aspect rather than the physical aspects of it yeah uh and then the other one is ain't no sunshine um men i don't know why i i have the uh, a thing but it's a, you know it meant something the 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 pain of heartbreak mm-hmm. um and we i think it was like 36 men that we interviewed and they they talk about what it was like to lose love, whether it was through being dumped, mm. uh, death, divorce. Um, and it was, it, was, it was really kind of a revelation to both of us. We, we really didn't expect, I think most women think that after a breakup, the second that the guy breaks up or you break up with him or he breaks up with you, he's skipping out the door and on, you know, like a bee on to the next flower. And, and we found out, no, that's really not the case. I guess maybe that might be the case when he skips out the door um, mm-hmm. after breaking up with you. But if you break up with him, man, mm-hmm. some of these guys, I mean, for years, they couldn't get over it. And it was like, mm-hmm. what? So it was, it, it was very informative. Some of the stories were funny. Yeah. Some of them were really tragic and sad. Mm-hmm. But it was... You know, it, it was a good look into the male psyche. Ah, so, that's you know, uh, Yeah, and, and then we also, um, we interviewed bartenders for that mm-hmm. book because, you know, a bartender, it's... Yeah, it's they like, hear all the stories. Like the right? uh, we also interviewed psychics. Mm. And um, it was just, it was really kind of, it, it was very illuminating. That's I thought. very interesting. Yeah. That's very interesting. The, um, the, the, um, the 70 serial virgin, I'm not going to be able to get over that for a while. That's going to be stuck in my head now. Well, he, no, no, no. He wasn't a virgin at 70. Oh, it was the first time he had, se- what? Yeah, he's talking about, no, these were people that gave us their stories. They ranged in age from 20 to 77. Oh, he was 77. He gave the yeah, story. Okay. He wasn't at a virgin. 77, I don't think, if he'd never Sorry. had to before. I was going to say, my, if, if, if I lost okay. my Virginia. 77 i i break a hip or something i don't know um i don't know they have energy for that the uh i'd be like uh we're gonna lose my virginity uh uh let me have a sandwich and uh, i'll think about that yeah um so he was 77 years old telling about how he tell the story the first time okay. yeah all right yeah. that's good because i was just like going wow so he's an old virgin but yeah. uh 
How what was the oldest person then that lost their virginity, or did you ask him that? When like oldest when they lost person, their virginity? Yeah, yeah. No, we we asked. Um, how old was the oldest person? I'm just curious. Was, like 34 years old. It was a guy. 34? It was oh. a guy. I could be wrong, but I mean, I, I think he was in his 30s. I mean, because it was like, whoa, dude. But he, yeah, it was a guy. And I, the youngest, I think, was 12. You could, and you could that do it. Was, that was a freaking, that was a, ooh. Was it consensual? The story was just, I mean, it was just. Mm. Um, you could probably do another book called The Incel Diaries about right how people uh, haven't ever had sex and then they really want it bad enough, but they're angry at people because they're entitled. <laughs> I know. Like they and they're so angry that nobody will go to bed with them because they go, ew. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> What's wrong with this generation? I don't know. I know. I know. Um, so an interesting book, The Melt. Uh, anything more we should know about the book and what it's uh, what it's all about? Well, you know, I mean, we can't give uh, the whole book away. You know, no, I'm not sorry, audience. <laughs> but I, I would, I, I would, I would say, you know, basically, what it is, it's, it's not, it's not one of these Mad Max kind of books. Mm. It is an examination of human emotions mm. um, and how people would react to just losing everything that they hold dear. I mean, all of it, electricity, all of it, and. Um, you know, and, and how, how they get along, you know, I mean, yeah. what they do and, and also the, the, the fact that, you know, that we're living in the time that we're living in and we have so much at our disposal and it's lost, but there are still things that say that book, um, you know, that I had read that was written in the 1940s, um, they, it, it was kind of crazy because in, in that book, the guy kind of just, he wrote that 20 years later, these people are still eating canned goods from the supermarket shelves. Well, I'm sorry, that's just not going to happen. All right. Uh, first of all, the canned goods, you, I think you get sick if you ate something that old. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, um, and also the people in my book, even though they don't have the grid anymore, they still have um, access to certain technologies. Hmm. They have access to solar panels. Oh yeah. So they can, you know, they can they can generate their own electricity. They and then they also have access because, um, as is mentioned several times in the book, everything is free. They can go to a computer store and they can get all these computers. So they mm. can use those and they can get all of these how-to things. Mm. And, and, you know, so they, so they have a leg up mm. because they can, they can learn things that they can learn skills that they don't know because it's all out there. And mm. a lot of it is on video disc and, and a lot of it that isn't, well, then they also have libraries just that, that they can go to and, and get all of this knowledge. So um, it, it, it's a little different. And so I'm, you know, I'm just, that's what I really tried to portray in which will, I will be portraying as well as, as, as um, other things that I, I do know one thing that I'm going to get started. And it actually did, it does start a little tiny bit in volume one, although nobody will probably recognize it. Mm -hmm. But I'll expand on it in volume two. Oh, we have something to look forward to in volume two. This this could be uh, quite the story you're going on. Yeah. Uh, a, interesting tome. Um, so uh, you guys can check it out. You can go on Amazon.com. Look for The Melt. And it uh, shows the planet uh, with a giant melting thing that reminds me of ice cream on there. So I might have some ice cream after this. Uh <laughs> That's supposed to be, it must be the hungry, glacier is melting. <laughs> the glacier is melting. It looks like ice cream to me. I freaking love that cover. Yeah, it's an awesome cover. And it's got and a little awesome fire thing made on me it. that cover. The world's going to hell. And yeah, <laughs> pretty much 20. Definitely a book for 2020. So yes, there you it go. is. It's like maybe that's, maybe, I mean, maybe you're just prophetic or psychic and you were just like, I this really, I I'll start in 2016, but this really can't come out of the can till 2020 because there's something going down that this is just going to be right along with. So, <laughs> and everything else. I think it's interesting you incorporate some of the characters. Though. Do people wear their masks in this book, by the way? I don't know. Actually, no, they don't. They don't. 
See, you know, that, there's, there's that's a one lesson thing right that, there. that I never added to it. Um, but they didn't really have, I mean, really from start to finish. Mm -hmm. By the time that my characters, when they found out about it, it was just in the beginning of November. Mm -hmm. By the end of December, they were in their shelter. That's wow. how quickly this thing moved. Wow. Um, so, I mean, nobody, nobody really had time. They mm -hmm. could see what was happening on television in other parts of the world mm -hmm. because, you know, it's spread out from, from Mongolia um, and, it, and, and from Mongolia because of what happened. There was a team that went in when this body it was discovered and it went back to Great Britain. So then it spread from Europe and, and then the way that it gets in the States is addressed and all that stuff. So it's just, um, but no, I didn't have masks or any of that stuff because they're really, nobody really. It moves so fast. And, yeah, it I moves mean, so fast that nobody really had the time to even think. I mean, they got their, there was the thing that, you know, that, that they were, you know, go home, you know, wash your hands, stay away from people. It was that kind of a thing. That was the advice they got because that's common sense advice. And that's what I thought of when I, you know, when I was writing the book. Mm -hmm. And of course, and that's what they told everybody, you know, when we actually had the pandemic here. Yeah. Um, so that's pretty interesting. The melt. This would make a great movie, huh? I think it would make an excellent movie. <laughs> There you go, Hollywood. Option this baby right away. Uh, wait for the other two book, two or three books, and then there you go. You got yourself a full screenplay. Um, anyway, guys, check it out. Go to Amazon.com. Check out Ann Werner. Uh, and give us your plugs one more time where people can find you on the interwebs. All right. You can find me at A-N-N-W-E-R-N-E-R.info. -E -E That's my website, annwerner.info. And if you go to Amazon.com and you put my name in there, all my books will pop up. So just type Ann Werner into your search uh, for Amazon uh, in, in the Amazon search engine and my name will come up and it'll show my books and you can go to my author page and I'll have all my books on there. Um, and then I am at, at Ms. Ms. Werner on Twitter and then I'm Ann Werner author on Facebook. There you go. She's everywhere on the interwebs. Yes, um, so, so check out the book, The the Melt. I almost said The Thing. Sorry about that. <laughs> I like that movie. It's James The Burgess. Thing, you know. Okay. <laughs> so The <laughs> Melt. I mean, that that could be like, a, I, I can see this being, you know, multi-part. You could have like, well, the first book could be like part one, and the second book could be part, part two, and, you know, you just have the whole, it'll just be like The Terminator. It'll just keep running right going for like there you go. years. It'll be a franchise. Yeah. I'll be melting. <laughs> hey guys, be sure to check out the book. You get Arnold to do it. Uh, go to thecvpn.com, subscribe to all our podcasts, tell everyone to uh, join up there. You can see all the great authors on our show at amazon.com forward slash shop forward slash Chris Voss. Uh, you can also go to patreon.com forward slash Chris Voss to see our new book club and youtube.com forward slash Chris Voss to see the uh, live version of this or video version of this uh, interview. Thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks for Ann for being here. We'll see you guys next time. And I think that should be it. <laughs>